we were handling the back of the room at an event, oh gosh, maybe 12, 15 years ago now. It was in Atlanta, if memory serves me correctly. And the speaker on the stage had happened what every speaker who's a platform seller dreams of. They had the true table rush. I mean, people were literally back there throwing their credit cards at us to process to get in on this guy's offer that he had made from the stage. When all was said and done, he had generated $375,000 worth of sales for his, you know, 60 or 90 minute presentation. Wow. You know, and I mean, you might think fantastic, that's great or whatever. Well, what was not so great is about 30 days after that, every single penny of that $375,000 had to be refunded to the attendees. You are now listening to the Highlight Real Builder for Authors, the Going North Podcast. I'm your host, best-selling author and Maxwell Leadership Certified Trainer, Dom Brightman. And you're going to be getting some tips and techniques to advance yourself coming up next. Today's episode is sponsored by both books, Going North, Tips and Techniques to Advance Yourself, and the follow-up bestseller, Stay the Course, The Elite Performer's Seven Secret Keys to Sustainable Success. Head over to Amazon.com, pick up both books. They are available in a trifecta of paperback, audio, and ebook. Cop all three of both and be on the lookout for another book from yours truly to help podcasters succeed. Now let's get on with today's episode. And today on the Highlight Real Builder for Authors, known as the Going North Podcast, we got another super special, awesome human for you today. That's right, indeed. And this ain't your ordinary super special awesome human my man is definitely a cream of the crop that's right the cream of the crop who is at the top indeed because he is a 25 year veteran in the speaking industry as well as a number one best-selling author folks and my man has many skills and many talents but one of his specialties is back of the room sales indeed and for those list of shows aspire to be speakers in business and Thanks to the year that should not be named far behind us, three years behind us, folks are probably going to be looking for some tips who may be going to those in-person events indeed. So let's give it up for the BR, who's probably going to be your bro in business because he's going to help you get to your next level. Let's give it up for Brett Ridgeway. Woo-hoo. Hey, Dom, how's it going tonight, man? <laughs> man, it is going north. I'm honored to have you here, my man. Sounds good, man. Uh, let's have some fun. Let's share share some things that'll help your listeners out, man. Woohoo! That's friend Dick is sharing is caring. So my goodness, as you know, introductions aren't allowed to be ninety seven point three days long, and it probably only covered maybe point one day of what you actually do. <laughs> so am I filling in, folks, of how you got to where you are today? Yeah, you know, it's one of those stories, Dom, where you can definitely trace back specific things that happened that weren't planned by and large that, you know, had you down one path and you took a fork in the road and you took another fork and another fork and you ended up somewhere you hadn't ever imagined you would end up. But actually way back in the, like the mid-90s, 1995, I think it was, I actually put up the first portal website in the plant engineering and maintenance industry. So back in those day, days, I was... I was selling VHS tapes. I'm going to date myself there, but uh, books, manuals aimed at plant engineers, maintenance technicians, that particular group of people. And around the same time frame, I actually had a, a joint venture with a guy. And because of that joint venture, he called me up and asked me if I would handle the back sales table at his first internet marketing super conference. Now, I honestly, Dom, I didn't even know what backroom sales meant at the time, but I had not been to Las Vegas before, so it sounded good to me, and I said, sure, I'm in. Let's do it or whatever. So that first event was in 1999 where I handled the backroom for the very first time, and it led to a side business where over the next 15 years, I probably managed the back of the room at about 150 different events. And so we were in fairly high demand in the early 2000s because we actually, you know, we had a merchant account that would let us process a whole lot of money in a short period of time with multiple speakers, which was hard, kind of hard to get. So event promoters would call us up and say, hey, can you manage this back room for me? So we pay the speakers, we pay the promoter, we take a cut of the promoter's share for handling the back of the room. 
So as a, a result of handling the back room at all those events, I got to know a lot of speakers in the industry fairly well. I mean, and, and, you know, big name people that we were dealing with on stage, you know, the Russell Brunsons of the world. I don't know if you heard of Russell, but oh, Alex wow. Mendoza and John Asaraf. I mean, a lot, lot of big names. Anyway, when they found out that I was doing product fulfillment for my own website that I put up in the mid 90s, one of them cornered me at an event in about, oh, gosh, 2002 and said, hey, Brett, will you take over some fulfillment for me because I don't really want to do it. And I had been thinking about it for a while because it was kind of a natural outgrowth of all the people I had gotten to know in the industry. And so we said, sure, why not? So partner and I formed a company called Speaker Fulfillment Services in 2003, I believe it was. And Speaker Fulfillment Services provides product duplication and fulfillment services for speakers, authors, information marketers. So they do all the duplication and packaging and, and warehousing and shipping of information product orders out to the end customers on behalf of all these speakers. And so because of my unique perspectives, number one in the back of the room about 150, 150 different events, I actually probably witnessed you know, like 2,000 different speakers in person. So I saw what they do well and what, honestly, many of them fail miserably at. And then between the back of the room and then being the fulfillment partner for a lot of these big names, I, I kind of had a unique perspective that others don't have in terms of seeing what is good, what is bad, what is ugly in the industry, what's working, what's not working or whatever. And so between the, the course of the, the, back, the back of the room and all the things I had to do with information marketing, et cetera, you know, that, that turned me into being an author. And so I wrote a number of books aimed at speakers and authors and information marketers and event promoters, all in that expert niche, so to speak. And so now actually I have formally parted ways with the fulfillment company I founded 20 years ago because all the speaking I did, I mean, I was in the back room for a long time, Don, but I was, I'm, I'm a natural introvert. And so it took me about 10 years to get up enough gumption to get up on the stage myself and share some of what I have learned along the way. But I did that eventually. And you know, it's one of those things where all the speaking I did initially was on behalf of speaker fulfillment services. So if you would go to these multiple speaker events, it would be a lot of people selling from the stage. And so they would bring me in to be a, a content buffer, so to speak. So rather than pitch, 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 it would be pitch, let's have a content session only with no pitching involved. And then another speaker who might be pitching or whatever. So I spoke at a number of events just as a content provider, but it was always on behalf of speaker fulfillment services. And so I, I've decided again to part ways with the fulfillment company. And now for the first time in my life, I'm actually branding Brett Ridgeway and sharing in a more formal way, you know, what I've learned along the way with people who feel like they have a message they want to share with the world, but they don't really have a freaking clue how the speaking industry really works and you know the pieces you need to put into place and all that so that's kind of where my path is, has led me to now and honestly dom it's probably something i should have done 10 years ago or whatever but you know didn't have the courage didn't have the fortitude or whatever it was to step out and you know make myself a front man so to speak and just for myself so here's where we are today man that's why we're talking sweet Congratulations, especially 20 years. My goodness, 2003, was it? <laughs> Your business, the back of the room business? You know, I, I think about all those events I've been to over the years, and I can, I can remember specific events back even in the early 90s. You remember a guy named Gary Halbert at all? He was an old, well-known copywriter years ago. And when an event rolled through, uh, an event as in a hurricane rolled through Florida, in like 1992, he put on a, a relief seminar that was, you know, it was all donations only for hurricane relief. And that's where I, I got my first exposure into the whole world of direct marketing and, you know, hearing some of the big names on stage, you know, people like Ted Nicholas and Carl Galetti and, and Brad and Alan Anton and, and a, lot, a lot of people who were very big in direct marketing at the time. And, you know, the industry has changed a bunch since then, obviously, but you know, again, it was my first foray in terms of seeing these people up on the stage. And honestly, how many people have thought, you know, man, you know, you're sitting in an audience and you're, and you're thinking, that should be me up on that stage sharing my story or my mission or whatever. So, you know, my mission now is to help those people who have that dream to get in front of others and share what they've learned and inspire others to try to do it in the right way and build a profitable speaking business around what 
is their unique self. So ah, you love to see it indeed. You love to see it indeed. So my goodness, so for those who probably need to generate sales at the back of the room, there are probably some things they should avoid when they're in the front of the room. So any tips of things to avoid or some traps to avoid so that way folks will actually go to the back of the room to buy some product and stuff? Yeah, let, let me tell you a story first, Dom. So we were handling the back of the room at an event, oh gosh, maybe 12, 15 years ago now. It was in Atlanta, if memory serves me correctly. And the speaker on the stage had happened what every speaker who's a platform seller dreams of. They had the true table rush. I mean, people were literally back there throwing their credit cards at us to process to get in on this guy's offer that he had made from the stage. When all was said and done, he had generated $375,000 worth of sales for his, you know, 60 or 90 minute presentation. Wow. You know, and I mean, you might think fantastic, that's great or whatever. Well, what was not so great is about 30 days after that, Every single penny of that $375,000 had to be refunded to the attendees because the product he had sold from the stage was a SaaS product, a, a, a web builder tool of some type or whatever. And it ended up having some kind of bug in it that they could never figure out. So it didn't work. And so every single penny had to be refunded. So it was a, a major embarrassment for the speaker, obviously. It was a massive hit on the pocketbook of the event promoter. And it didn't help my pocketbook e either, honestly, because I take a cut of the promoter's mo money for managing the back of the room. But so the, the lesson there was, you know, if you're going to sell something from the stage, first of all, don't sell something that isn't complete and fully tested. Now, you know, there's an exception to that in terms of if you're going to sell a, a coaching program or something that you're going to develop in real time and, you know, record the sessions as you go to create a product. That's one thing, but if you're selling some type of software product or something where you have a specific deadline promised, we were doing another in another event up in, I think it was Vancouver a few years after that, and the speaker made a nice pitch from the stage. Now, it wasn't $375,000 worth of sales, but it was thirty or 40000 or whatever, nothing to sneeze at, and you know they, they were developing a training program of some type, if memory serves me correctly, and they told the attendees that it would be ready to go in a, in a week or two. Well, invariably, you know, two weeks uh, turned into three, turned into four, turned into six, and they had to refund every penny again because they couldn't meet the deadline that had been promised. So be very careful what you're going to offer from the platform because none of us need those kind of embarrassing situations happening. Oh, we can't afford it financially, and we can't afford it for our ego, and we can't afford it for our reputation in the industry. So yeah it's true especially nowadays where word travels even faster than it did years ago like social media my oh goodness. yeah i can't imagine yeah so i mean you asked specifically about some tips for selling more effectively from the stage or whatever well one of the biggest things you gotta remember if you're a, a platform selling speaker is that the typical split between the event promoter and the speaker is a 50 50 split so if you sell a hundred dollar product you get 50 the promoter gets 50. now what promoters want on their stage are people that are selling high ticket offers, you know, a thousand, two thousand dollar offers, because there's obviously a lot more money in it for them. I mean, they hope to cover a lot of their costs with their ticket sales, but the real they make their real money on the, their split of the back end sales, you know, from all their speakers on the platform. So they don't want people up there promoting a twenty dollar book or whatever. They want people who are selling a you know a mastermind or group coaching or one-on-one -on -one coaching or something that's a higher ticket price on it so that it's, it's worth their while to have you on that stage. And so in essence, it can be a catch 22 for the speaker because some people will go in with the mindset, well, I'm going to get as many people onto my list as possible because, and then I'll sell them whatever that higher yeah. ticket thing is later on. But, you know, believe me, the event promoters frown on that because they want that higher ticket item on the stage, not those low ticket items. And they certainly don't want any speaker coming in who's basically just trying to harvest their list. So, you know, that's where a speaker will come in and, and give away something for free or a low ticket item in exchange for an email address. Again, with the goal just of getting as many people out of that audience onto their own list and not just on the promoter's list. And promoters generally will not want you to go that approach because even if you agree to give them a 50-50 split on something you sell after the fact to those people, 
Well, they don't have a real way to police that, so to speak. So it's an honor yeah. system thing, and they're not they're not really wanting to go that route because, again, there's no accountability to speak of. And honestly, you got to guard your reputation very carefully as a speaker. And so it's not one of those things that you want to do, but it is something that I have seen happen, and you got to be cognizant of it both from a speaking and in a hosting standpoint. Yeah. Uh... Definitely good tips indeed and good information too. <laughs> Something to avoid. It's so true. It's like, hey, you definitely got to guard your reputation and you don't want to be the guy or gal on stage like, yep, let me uh, just grab a thousand emails. If there's a thousand folks in the crowd. That's right. Harvest these emails. So I'll tie heaven. That's right indeed. <laughs> yeah, you will be uninvited from stages pretty quickly if you get a reputation for, for doing something like that. Now, you know, one of the things I honestly see speakers very weak on, Dom, is – when they're selling from that platform and they drive people to the back of the room to order whatever that is, what they should have is some type of upsell available in the back of the room. So people are already pulling out their credit card. They're already in a, in a buying mood or whatever. So, you know, add on an extra webinar or bonus webinar or two or, a, you know, a private coaching call for an hour or whatever. And for, a, you know, a little bump in the price or whatever. And a lot of people will take advantage of that because, again, they're already they're wanting you. You you convince them from the platform that you're somebody that they want to follow and be into your world or whatever. So when you got them in that buying frenzy, I mean, we see it online all the time, the upsell. I mean, you go something and then do you want this? Do you want this? And you can't get carried away with it. I mean, you don't want to get into what we call upsell hell, but you should, <laughs> have, a, you should have an additional thing that you're offering in the back of the room to try to bump up the size of that order a little bit. So that you make more money and the promoter makes more money and give more value to the attendees, even above and beyond that that core product that you were selling. So def definitely think about the upsell as a speaker. Another thing I honestly think speakers are very weak in is looking at the demographics of their audience ahead of time and figuring out who's in that audience and how can I best establish rapport with this audience so that they're more likely to, to purchase something from me if I'm selling from the platform. And it takes a little bit of homework. I mean, it's it's a little bit of work to find these things out. But if you're a speaker and you're going into an event, you've got to look at two key, two key things. Number one is who else is speaking from that platform? What are they selling? What's their price point? What's their topic? I was doing an event a few years ago, Dom, and the event promoter, it was like a four-day event, and they had like 25 different speakers over the course of four days. So it was a pretty intensive thing. And for whatever reason, no thought was given up front to you know, developing a curriculum or some kind of <laughs> flow of the event that would most benefit the attendees. It was all about getting the names on the stage. So if it was a big name, then they got on the platform. Well, as it turned out, he had three separate speakers all talking about the subject of copywriting. Now, while copywriting is a very important subject, by the time they got to that third speaker on copywriting, the audience was totally tuned out, you know, been there, heard that or whatever. And that particular speaker's chances of selling anything from the platform was about zero because people had already, people that were interested in copywriting resources had already been tapped out by the previous two speakers on that subject. So if he had done his homework ahead of time, he would have found out who the other speakers were, what they were talking about, and maybe figure that wasn't the right stage for him. You know, he maybe should have passed on that one or come up with a different topic that still would have been a benefit to the audience. But he was a copywriting guy, and that's what he came in thinking he was going to teach, and it was too late for him to switch gears or whatever. So definitely do your homework in advance of an event and find out who else is sharing that platform with you. And then you got to look at the demographics of the audience, obviously. I mean, are they men, women? What's their age? Are they, what's their educational level? What are their expectations? What are their pain points? How can you best craft your speech or presentation to address the real pain points that they have? One of my biggest pet peeves in the speaking industry is what we call the hit and run speaker. You know, somebody that shows up five minutes before they're scheduled to go on stage, do their talk, and five minutes after they're done, they're out the door. They had no chance to build any kind of real rapport with the audience. They're not working in the crowd. They're not getting to know people and establish some additional rapport. It's all about 
what I can do from that platform. Wham, bam, thank you, man, I'm gone. And it is a extreme disservice to the event promoter, obviously, because you know they are there to deliver value to their attendees. And when you have somebody that just hits and runs, it, it leaves a sour taste in the attendee's mouth and it leaves a sour taste in the event promoter's mouth. And we talked about reputation a little bit earlier, but you will get the reputation as a hit and run speaker and, and not be invited to platforms if you're not willing to put in some time to truly help them have a better event, essentially. So if you're going to a book world speaker event, you really ought to be in the meeting room as much as possible and hear what the other speakers are saying. So maybe you can tag on to some of their comments or whatever, or you don't say something that's necessarily 180 degree opposite divisive with them or whatever and, and create a lot of confusion in the crowd. And you get a chance to know the attendees. So maybe you can call some of them out in a positive way, obviously, during the course of, the, of, of your presentation or whatever. Go establish far better rapport by meeting people ahead of your speech and have them looking forward to it versus just being there and gone. So demographics is important and, and truly being present at an event, I think, is very important. Even if you're a keynote speaker, you need to study the demographics of the audience ahead of time. Again, what are those pain points? Why is this corporation or association bringing you in to their event? What is what is, what do they want you to address? What's the pain point? You need to find out who those movers and shakers are in the audience from that corporation so that maybe you can involve them in the presentation in some way or whatever. But it's all about building rapport and, and it takes some effort. But if you truly want to succeed as a speaker, you've got to put the effort in to do those various types of things. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. Definitely indeed. And you're so right about that. And to, so you don't want to be the whole mercenary coming in and be like, yep, five minutes before. Yep. I'm ready to go. Got my water ball pumped up, give my speech and then skedaddle and get off to the flight or whatever without actually building that rapport. Cause like from even for personal experience, like really just actually attending the event and just, connecting with folks in the crowd and building the audience like heck you'll even get more attendees by doing that too as opposed to just showing up at the last minute like you're a superhero that could, you're gonna save yeah. the day <laughs> and I mean, it's very unfair to the event promoter because you know if you have an audio video crew then you know you're getting mic'd up two minutes before you go on stage so you don't really have a way to test things out if you have a powerpoint presentation they mm. can't really plug it in and test it and make sure there's no issues or whatever so i mean you're creating barriers for yourself that you don't have to create. I mean, when you're a speaker, you need to control as much of your speaking climate, your environment as possible. And by being a hit run speaker, you you give up control of certain things that you definitely should not give up control of. So, you know, you have, we have in the industry what we call these, uh, oh, what's the word I want? These prima donna speakers. And, and a hit and run speaker is a, an example of that. But there are many other categories of prima donna speakers. We actually had a guy, Dom, one time who was at an event. I was handling the back of the room, and he insisted that he had to have green M&Ms only in a bowl on stage. So he was asking somebody to get out M&Ms, sort out the packages, only put green ones in a bowl and put that on stage. But other prima donnas could be like your, uh, you know, the, the lady speaker who has to have a certain type of bottle of water chilled to exactly 57.6 degrees. You know, or the guy who swoops in with his whole entourage, expects them to be comped into the event and give them prime seating in the front of the room. You oh, know, yeah. or the guy who expects to be treated differently from every other speaker on that platform. You know, I want a limousine at the airport for me because I'm special when nobody else is, you know, is getting that kind of treatment. Or or maybe you have an extra hotel room, so you comp a speaker a room because you had extra, you know, gift rooms in your block or whatever. And they end up running a big room service bill on you or something like that. I mean, I've seen all these kind of things happen, and it just it just blows my mind what so, some people will do, thinking that they're, you know, better than everybody else. I mean, yes, you need to have confidence in yourself and all that, but coming in with the attitude that everybody, you know, what, what's the word? <laughs> I, I don't know if I want to say it on here or not. You know, your shit don't stink or whatever. Then, yeah, you know, you're one of these people that I don't want to deal with, but. Uh, they're out there, certainly. Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. It's funny, the green m and kind of reminds I forgot which, which band it was. I'm not sure if it was Metallica or something. They have that in their contract just so to make sure the folks actually read the contract. 
<laughs> well, I guess that's funny you mentioned that. So, I, you know, we mentioned before that the typical split between a speaker and promoter is 50-50. Well, there was a gal one time who got the speaker contract from the event promoter, and she had crossed out that particular section and wrote in 70-30 in her favor or whatever and sent it back. And the event promoter didn't notice it or whatever. So it was oh, wow. obligated because they had accepted the contract. He was obligated to honor that, but that was the last time she was ever on his stage, believe me. Yeah, yeah. It's like, uh, <laughs> try to pull up fast, but yeah, yeah. Fast track your way to not on any more stages. <laughs> oh, I could tell you horror story after horror story, man. So you want, you want another good one? I got another good one for you. So the fulfillment company I founded, Speaker Fulfillment Services, was handling the product launch for a speaker a few years ago. He was in the Forex market, the Forex space, foreign exchange currency. So oh, you know, making money, making money by trading commodities, et cetera, or whatever. And he'd done a number <laughs> of launches before that, but he did this particular launch, opened up his shopping cart one morning, and then suddenly, about three hours later, wham, his merchant account got shut off. Well, what most people don't realize is when you set up a merchant account, you're going to define an average ticket price and an expected monthly volume that you're going to be running through that account for the, the credit card processor. Mm. Well, when you suddenly do a product launch that they're not aware of and you have a massive spike in your dollars running through your account, that's a major red flag to them of possible fraud. Mm. And so when that happened, they shut him off because – for lack of a simple phone call, picking up the phone and saying, hey, Mr. Merchant Account Provider, I'm doing a new product launch. We expect that we're going to be doing this over the next couple of days or whatever. I mean, they're fine with that if they know ahead of time, but they didn't pick up the phone, didn't call. And in my estimation, based on the previous launches, Dom, they lost somewhere between three hundred dollars and $400,000 worth of sales, all for not picking up the phone and making a simple phone call. Mm. Ouch. <laughs> Ouch. My goodness, my goodness. Hey, that's the power, especially for those nowadays who don't like to use the phone to call people. It's like, hey, you better make sure you make that call if you got one of those merchant accounts selling some goods and services like that. <laughs> that is an important one for sure. <laughs> so my goodness, so since you're a veteran in business, I always like to ask about setbacks that actually turned into successes. So for you in particular in your business, has there been a big setback in business that actually became your biggest success? Hmm, great question. So a couple of things come to mind. And one of it's about flexibility and adaptability and all that. But this first example would be from the days working with the fulfillment company. So, you know, back in, back in the day, Dom, information products, were physical in nature more so than digital. And it was all about the big box packages, we call it. So how many DVDs, CDs, manuals could you pack together? So you had real thump value. You know, it was all about the big package. Well, you know, times have changed. Information products have slimmed down considerably. They've gone on a drastic diet. And a lot of the yeah. content is delivered strictly digitally now. So the fulfillment company had to adapt majorly obviously because the model changed i mean they weren't doing the the big box packages anymore so we had to create new services and even these have now become obsolete but we did a, a print on demand service called disc delivered that was for cds and dvds so you get an order only when you get an order will we produce the disc package it up in a self mailer and send it out to your client and then, uh, you know, more and more people wanted on-demand type things. So a, a service was delivered called Booklets Delivered that would do, you know, small four by six, roughly up to 60 page booklets or whatever, again, on-demand type thing. So definitely, you know, had to adapt in the industry over the years. Now, from a personal standpoint, you know, I, I think about mistakes I've made, and I certainly made my share of them, honestly. I was scheduled to be a, a guest on a radio show when I had a new book coming out, it was one of my books called Mistakes Authors Make. And I was scheduled to be on the show, but it was, it was at a weird time. It was like on a Sunday afternoon at 2 p.m. or whatever. So oh. I got home from church and got busy doing some yard work or something. And I just totally spaced, totally forgot about it or whatever. Well, I, I you know, I reached out and tried to make amends and all that, but they didn't want to hear anything thing of it or whatever. And I honestly beat myself up for weeks over that one. I mean, I felt bad. 
But, uh, you know, in the scheme of things, that was a bump in the road, so to speak. You know, my biggest mistake, honestly, is not having the courage, Dom, to step out maybe 10 years ago and do, do what I'm doing now. You know, stepping up to help others directly, build a speaking business, you know, whether I'm just in, I'm in a different place or I have a different level of confidence or whatever it may be, you know, I, I should have done what I'm doing now 10 years ago. So, you know, life goes on, man. I'm so I'm, I'm reinventing myself at the age of 64, man. Woohoo, sweet. That's right, indeed. For the dyslexic folks, get me 46. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, indeed. That's right, indeed. So, my goodness, so since you got a podcast of your own and you've been guesting on radio and podcast for years on end, even though there was a delay, is there a question that you wish hosts would ask you more often as a guest? Hmm, boy. You know, I love storytelling, Dom. So any any question related to, you know, that l- lets me tell a story is good by me. I mean, I, I built up quite the bank of, of speaking industry stories over the years, as well as stories related to the, you know, the whole world of book publishing. And we could talk about book publishing for an hour or two. But, you know, anything that opens up storytelling opportunities, because stories are what people relate to. And they're what really tune people into you. And so when you open your soul up a little bit and bear those stories or whatever, good, bad, or ugly, I think you build a better rapport with your audience. So any question you want to ask that lets me tell a story, man, I am good with. Sweet. You'll love to see it indeed. You'll love to see it indeed. Well, who knows? There might even be a story behind this one because a fun question you love to ask authors about their books is if their book was a food, what would it be and why? And I guess today's book is viewed from the back. So if that book were a food, what would it be and why? Oh, that would be a, uh, what's the word they use now for those little meat meat and cheese sampler trays? What's the word? Oh, it's, oh God. Those those boards, right? <laughs> yeah, cutiary or something like that. Charcuterie board, I think. <laughs> That's it, charcuterie board. So yeah, it would be a charcuterie board because it's a bunch of short tips that one can sap one and consume quickly. So it would be a charcuterie board. <laughs> Sweet. That's right indeed. So that means if you read this book, you can become your own board member. You love to see it. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you're a funny man, Dom. You're a- <laughs> oh, man. So, my goodness. So, if you're going to wake up tomorrow and you're 25 again, but still in 2023, what advice would you give to yourself? Go for it. Don't have, don't have the lack of confidence or insecurity to put yourself out there. If you have a desire to do something... Don't be afraid of failure. You will have failures along the way, but if you're not trying anything, you're not advancing, you're not doing anything. I mean, so you, you got you got to fail to move forward. And so go for it, man. Go for it. Sweet. That's right, indeed. Go for it. That's right. Don't give yourself that 10 year delay for no reason. That's right, indeed. You got the experience and expertise. Go ahead and go forth. That's right. Go forth and conquer. That's right. That's right. Bring a cactus with you if you have to, for no reason. <laughs> cactus? Why a cactus? I don't know. It just came out of my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm staying away from you then, man. <laughs> well, it's better than a porcupine. The porcupine will move on its own. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. <laughs> oh, man. Well, for my goodness, I hear you got some stuff coming out. So anything that folks need to be looking forward to in the future from you, my man? (laughs) Yeah, I would encourage people. I have a new book coming out in March, Dom. It's called How to Build a Profitable Speaking Business. And you can pre-order it now at brittridgeway.com forward slash books. And then I'm actually putting, based on my 25 years behind the scenes experience, I'm putting together what I call a master class titled From Novice Speaker to Stage Ready Pro. And that will be for people who feel like they have a message with to share with the world, don't really know how to do it. So we'll help them along the way. And that will be releasing sometime in March, I expect. Still working out all the dates. But uh, again, that information about that particular event or series of events can be found at brettridgeway.com. So thank you so much.
Woohoo! So you heard that right, folks. A man's got a whole wealth of knowledge for you to devour indeed. So a man shared probably 0.5% of what he actually freaking knows. So be on the lookout for that master class and that wonderful book indeed. If you want to take yourself from novice to pro, that's right indeed. That's right indeed. You'll be so much of a pro. You'll get to have a championship belt. That's right indeed. That's right indeed because we got a champ of wisdom right here who's shared some great wisdom indeed. Some great wisdom indeed. Indeed, so my goodness, Brett, my man, any parting words before I close up shop? Parting words. My, my best bit of advice for people is don't hesitate to find yourself a coach or a mentor that can help you along your way. You will spend far more time and money trying to do it yourself and learn, learn about the school of hard knocks. And you'll spend far more time and money trying to do yourself versus finding a mentor. So find somebody that resonates with you, who's been down the path that you want to go down and get involved with them because they can shorten your learning curve significantly. Thanks a bunch for investing your time by listening to this wonderful podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you really did, do me a solid and leave a review or share this episode with at least three people that you think would get some value out of today's content. Advance others to advance yourself.